Madam Secretary, and uh, today, of course, we are having a hearing on the budget. The hearing always covers a range of economic issues, so we'll start with a look at the state of the economy as we meet this morning. Right now, the United States has the strongest major economy in the world. Don't have to take my word for it. Trump advisor Stephen Moore agreed with that statement in a recent interview. Wages rising significantly faster than inflation, which has come down. The labor market has never been better for workers. There's been real progress on income inequality. This is a period of booming entrepreneurship in America as new business applications are up. Go back four years when COVID cases were filling up the hospitals and Americans were stuck at home wondering if and when they'd be able to stock up on toilet paper. Forecasts for the economy were dire. The economy under President Biden has smashed those negative forecasts to bits. Nearly every other country in the world with a developed, econ developed economy would love to trade places with the United States in 2024. Now, if you listen to Donald Trump, you would believe that the United States is on a fast track to the dark ages. What does he want to do when it comes to big economic uh, policy? For one, Trump allies are developing a new tax agenda, cooking up big plans for tax hikes on working Americans and middle class families. There'll be more tax breaks for multinational corporations and big handouts to those up at the very, very top, the billionaires. Donald Trump wants to repeal the Inflation Reduction Act. Colleagues, we spent a lot of time working on that in this committee room. He wants to, as part of that repeal, include the funding for the IRS that has vastly improved customer service and cracked down on wealthy tax cheats. All in all, Donald Trump's proposals would run bigger deficits and pile up more debt. That would make it impossible to shore up bedrock American programs like Medicare and Social Security. Recently, Donald Trump told an interviewer in the first interview on economics in quite some time that Donald Trump believes there's lots of room for cuts to these vital programs, particularly Social Security. His campaign had to walk it back because they know his real plans on these issues are a loser for the public. In my view, Americans want a strong economy. They want a fair shake for people who don't have big fortunes and political power. And they want policies that drive down the cost of living in our country. That is not what Donald Trump has on offer, but that's exactly what we're zeroing in on. For example, last year I introduced the billionaire's income tax. There are now 18 Senate co-sponsors. President Biden's budget includes his own proposal, which has focused on ending the scheme that allows billionaires to pay what they want when they want to, and sometimes nothing at all for years on end. And it all involves, as the secretary knows, three words. If a billionaire doesn't want to pay taxes for a long time, they can just buy, borrow, and die. Do those three things, and you don't pay much if any taxes, and here's how it works. A billionaire acquires an asset, that just gains in value. Maybe they just buy five, six houses. Can't live them but one at a time, but they buy all these houses, just sit on them, borrow against them, and then when they die, um, all the uh, taxes are, are reconfigured. And uh, uh, meanwhile, people who earn a wage are paying taxes out of each and every paycheck. That's a basic unfairness. And I share the president's view that we're capitalists. We want people to be successful, make plenty of money, but we also believe in fairness. And that's what's on the line now, and the billionaire tax ought to be the centerpiece of the effort to save Social Security for future generations and uphold the Medicare guarantee. We also want to keep upgrading taxpayer service, already vastly improved thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act funding, while giving every American the opportunity to file tax returns directly with the IRS. By the way, this whole approach has been bipartisan in this committee for many years. I'm looking at uh, our friend from Tennessee, 
uh, Dan Coates at one time was on this committee and wrote a bipartisan bill with me to do just that. Direct file uh, opened widely in a handful of states last week. In just a matter of days, tens of thousands of Americans have filed or started their returns using this new system, and they are saving big on fees when they do so. That's progress that has to continue. Donald Trump's allies want to stop it. They'll side with the tax prep companies against typical taxpayers, and it's safe to say that Donald Trump himself is no champion of tax enforcement against the billionaires and the people at the top. Before I wrap up, I want to mention one other topic that members of this committee know a fair amount about. It has now been seven full weeks since 357 members of the House voted to pass legislation that was developed by Republican Chair Jason Smith and myself over a period of many months. The legislation restores important incentives, particularly for small business, uh, research and development incentives, and expands the child tax credit. Now, I've listened to many of my Republican Senate colleagues, and uh, I've made it clear that I will work with anybody who wants to find a way to get this done quickly. You've hear, heard all this talk, Madam Secretary, about, well, maybe you put it off till 2025. There's some big businesses that might be able to survive that. But these innovative, small companies that look at that R&D break as a lifeline, they're not going to make it until 2025. The number one concern I've heard from Republicans is the child tax credit look back policy. I heard that from a number of colleagues. They think that as structured by uh, Chairman Smith and I, that this would somehow discourage work. I don't happen to agree with that. The Joint Committee on Taxation doesn't happen to agree with it. But in order to make for a bipartisan bill, it's been a long time since we've had a bipartisan tax bill you know, around here. Some of my colleagues haven't even seen one. I have offered to take the look back provision out of what Chairman Smith and I developed if it helps us get this bipartisan bill over the finish line. Working with community leaders, Madam Secretary, we have found a way to do this and still lift the same number of kids out of poverty. I want colleagues of both parties on the committee to know that the offer to remove the look back uh, policy that was in the Smith-Wyden legislation is still on the table as of this morning, if we can find common ground and move ahead. And as I mentioned, uh, this idea of waiting till 2025, Madam Secretary, uh, particularly for these innovation-oriented small businesses, Senator Hassan has led the effort to point this out over several years, I think would cause us to do significant damage to the economy and certainly to the innovation ethic that colleagues on both sides of this dais have supported. Now, I'll wrap up by way of saying, I believe that there are more than 60 members of the Senate who want to act on this in a bipartisan way. So I'm going to keep you know, at it. You know, members may be tired of hearing about it after a few days, but I sure believe that it's important to do bipartisan tax work now that actually helps people. And if anything, it sets the table for 2025. With that, I turn it over to Senator Crapo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, thank you for being here. <clears throat> Last week, President Biden released his staggering $7.3 trillion budget proposal. As expected, it was filled with familiar partisan tax and spend proposals doubling down on an agenda that was rejected even when the Democrats had majorities in both the House and the Senate. The President proposes nearly $5 trillion in new and increased taxes. Tax increases of that magnitude will affect all Americans through lower paychecks and higher household expenses. However, the most notable tax increase Americans would face under the Biden budget is one that went conspicuously unmentioned. The tax increase that would result for households earning less than $400,000 
If the Tax Cuts from Republicans Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the TCJA, are not extended. While the administration continues to spread misleading information about the TCJA, they cannot deny that if the TCJA individual tax cuts are not extended, individuals making less than $400,000 would face more than $2 trillion in a tax increase, breaking the president's pledge. As many TCJA provisions are set to expire after next year, the differences between Biden's plan and the Republicans' actions have never been more stark. The TCJA led to one of the strongest economies in generations. Prior to the pandemic, the TCJA's pro-growth policies translated into wage increases, record low unemployment, higher incomes, stronger wage and wealth gains for lower income Americans than higher income Americans, and reduced inequality. In fact, the largest wage gains were concentrated in the bottom quarter of the wage scale. For American businesses, TCJA introduced a competitive tax rate while broadening the base, including by enacting the first global minimum tax of its kind, guilty, and putting an end to corporate inversions. It also led to record high corporate tax receipts, both nominally and as a share of gross domestic product. Instead of taking note of TCJA's successes, President Biden for the fourth time proposes trillions of dollars of tax hikes on American businesses. The Biden proposal proposes increasing the corporate tax rate to 28%, which according to the US Tax Foundation would result in the United States having the second highest combined rate among developed countries. Economists agree that a tax increase on American businesses will be passed on to working families in the form of higher prices and lower wages. The administration's failure to prioritize American businesses and workers extends to its international tax negotiations. Instead of defending the US global minimum tax guilty the administration again uses the OECD's global tax code to justify hiking taxes on American companies at rates far exceeding those imposed by other countries. Even more unfathomable is the administration agreeing to a deal that punitively treats vital congressionally enacted investment incentives like the R&D tax credit while blessing identical activities if delivered as government subsidies. But the global tax code is not the only concerning part of the international tax negotiations. The administration should have deep reservations about signing on to the OECD's global tax treaty at month's end. The Joint Committee on Taxation's recent analysis indicates that this deal reduces revenue, fails to provide certainty or stability, and would not halt discriminatory taxes targeting American companies which was the sole impetus for entering these negotiations. The list of tax increases goes on. Tax hikes on American energy production that would decrease our energy independence and eliminate good paying jobs. A tax hike on savings and investments. A tax hike on generational family businesses. While the list of tax increases grows, so does one tax giveaway. The green energy tax incentives included in the Inflation Reduction Act, which benefit China and, man and foreign manufacturing and have ballooned from an estimated cost of $270 billion over 10 years to $663 billion over 10 years. In stark contrast to the Republicans' achieved objective of lower taxes and competitive rates across the board, President Biden's vision for American workers and companies is clear. Higher taxes and uncompetitive rates for the majority to support government subsidies for a few. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kripa. Welcome, Madam Secretary. I know you've got a hard stop at 1230. We have great member interest on both sides. So uh, colleagues, we're all going to have to stick to five minutes, and uh, I'll just Go out on a limb here, Senator Crapo and I will stick to that and we'll make sure everybody gets in. Okay, Madam Secretary, welcome. Thank you, Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, 
and members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to testify. Over the past three years, the Biden administration has driven an historic economic recovery. GDP growth is strong, inflation has come down significantly, and the labor market is remarkably healthy. Real wages and household median wealth have increased since before the pandemic. Families are putting their additional income and accumulated savings back into the economy. And we see many signs of optimism from a record 16 million small business filings under this administration to improve consumer sentiment over the past three months. President Biden and I recognize that many American families still face challenges, such as high prices. So we're taking additional actions to bring down the costs of key household expenses, like energy and health care. We're also focused on expanding our economy's capacity to produce and create good jobs while reducing the deficit. As we implement the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Chips and Science Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act, we're creating economic opportunity for Americans, regardless of where they live and whether they have college degrees. And we've seen companies announce $650 billion in clean energy and manufacturing investments since the start of the administration. The modernization of the IRS, made possible by the IRA and discretionary appropriations, is enabling Americans to receive the support they deserve, including by driving significant improvements in customer service. Investments in the IRS are also enabling enforcement actions against tax evasion by the wealthiest Americans that cost our country over $150 billion a year. Actions such as recovering $500 million in taxes owed by millionaires to launching a new initiative to end abuse of corporate jet write-offs. The President's budget proposes additional investments to lower costs for workers and families and strengthen our economy while reducing the deficit. It proposes making health care more affordable for millions of Americans by making permanent the expansion of tax credits for health insurance programs enacted in the American Rescue Plan and extended in the Inflation Reduction Act. And the budget includes expanding the earned income tax credit, child tax credit, and low income housing tax credit proposals which would contribute to lowering child poverty and giving working families more breathing room in their household budgets. We can make these investments while reducing the deficit by $3 trillion over a decade through a combination of smart savings and tax proposals. President Biden and I continue to urge Congress to act so that the United States plays its part in the global minimum tax deal, which is currently being implemented in jurisdictions around the world to end the race to the bottom in corporate taxation. We've also proposed implementing a billionaire minimum tax so that the top one hundredth of a percent pay their fair share. Raising the tax on corporate stock buybacks to encourage businesses to reinvest profits in their workers and grow their companies, and closing estate and gift tax loopholes that allow wealthy Americans to pay less than they would otherwise owe. We will also continue to oppose misguided proposals that will grow the deficit by offering large tax breaks to the wealthy and big corporations. As a whole, the budget will enable us to continue to grow our economy and support workers and families while upholding our commitment to fiscal responsibility and reducing the deficit. 
I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Madam Secretary. You just set a land speed record for a secretary getting through their statement. We thank you. Madam Secretary, tax dodging in America has many faces, whether it's a crooked Swiss banker hiding American income, a billionaire deducting the personal use of private jets and super yachts, or the nearly 1,000 millionaires who somehow got away without even filing a tax return until the IRS really began to crack down. We have seen these tax dodges in a whole assortment of different uh, strategies. The biggest loophole, as I indicated, is buy, borrow, and die. You know, buy, borrow, and die is a glide path for billionaires to pay little or nothing, as I said, for years on end. Can you explain, Madam Secretary, why it's so important for billionaires to start paying taxes on this income? Because that's what it is. I agree with you. Under current law, some of the wealthiest Americans pay very little tax because they receive their income as capital gains, and those capital gains aren't taxed until realized and may escape income taxation entirely at death. So the president's budget would impose a minimum tax of 25% on total income, inclusive of unrealized capital gains. It would apply to the wealthiest one hundredth of a percent of taxpayers with more than $100 million in wealth. And the proposal would put an end to the situation that exists today uh, in which wealthy households, as you noted, borrow against their wealth. They use that borrowed wealth to finance a lavish lifestyle, while at the same time reporting that their wealth generates little or no income for tax purposes. Your proposal for a billionaire's income tax would address the same root problem using a slightly different approach, marking to market the value of publicly traded assets every year and imposing a deferral charge on other assets. And both the president's proposed approach, like yours, would really put an end to the problem of wealthy taxpayers with large investment gains reporting little income for tax purposes and often escaping any taxation at death. I remember the announcement. The president apparently was surprised one day uh, when they said, what do you think of Ron Wyden's proposal? He said, I like Ron Wyden's proposal. And then I was surprised a few weeks later because the president, and I appreciate it, Look at, looked at some of our concepts, so we've got a good strategy. Let's um, go next to the employee retention you know, tax credit, which has been riddled by fraud. Uh, Chairman Smith and I both have said, you know, we've got 95% of the claims coming in essentially tainted by fraud. If the Congress doesn't cut off these employee retention uh, claims by passing this bipartisan legislation, would you expect fraudulent claims to continue to flood the Internal Revenue Service? Well, I would. The administration has serious concerns about improper ERC claims. There, we've seen claims made by entities that did not exist or did not have employees during the period of eligibility. Um, right now, the IRS is actively auditing and conducting criminal investigations that are related to the false uh, ERC claims. And um, the legislation that you've proposed, um, I believe the administration believes makes critical investments in America to grow our economy, to lower costs for families, it advances bipartisan priorities, uh, like increasing the supply of housing, helping parents provide for their children, and supporting American innovation by investing in research and development. And I think it's a tremendous positive that the bill pays for these key investments by 
really protecting honest small business owners and ending um, a pandemic era, era program that is just let now me, let a me magnet. Get my, let me get my last question in under the gun. So this committee, in effect, started breaking 50 years worth of gridlock on climate change. For 50 years, there hadn't been anything on carbon taxes, there hadn't been anything on cap and trade. And in late spring of 2021, we came together around a private sector approach without mandates. It rewarded reducing carbon emissions. And particularly, it was technologically neutral, which authorities said was right at the heart of what we ought to do to have a new a kind of system. Can you commit that the Treasury Department is going to issue the proposed rules for these technology neutral incentives by June? Well, what I will commit is it is a very high priority item for us. We're working hard on it. I can't give you a precise date. We're working all of these tax rules involve collaboration with the Department of Energy and EPA, but uh, these are uh, at the top of our priority list. We want to get it out soon, and um, these will be important successors to the production tax credit and investment tax credit that have been driving explosive growth in the wind and solar Thank you. industry. Senator Crapo. Thank you. Secretary Yellen, according to the White House, under President Biden's 2025 budget, no one earning less than $400,000 per year will pay a penny in new taxes. I agree with that. I agree it's a bad idea to raise taxes on Americans suffering from record inflation at this point. Interestingly, though, the president's budget is essentially silent on extending the individual tax provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, many of which expire next year. This first question can be just a simple yes or no. Are you aware that the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which Republicans passed in 2017, reduced the taxes for Americans of all income groups, including those earning less than $400,000 per year? Yes, and the president has made clear that he would oppose raising back the taxes for uh, working people and families making under $400,000 when those provisions expire. So he would support expire. extending those tax he would. cuts. Good. That is good news. The TCJA also nearly doubled the standard deduction. Would that be included in what the president will continue to agree to support extending? Well, I can't give you details other than saying that whatever agreement is reached, he's committed to not raising taxes on households making under 400000 All right. I think that this next one you've already answered too, but I want to ask it specifically. The TCJA also doubled the child tax credit to $2,000 per child. Would you agree that if the TCJA child tax credit provisions are not extended, this would also result in a tax hike for Americans making under $400,000? Well, he, as I said, he's committed to not raising taxes on households making under $400,000 and has expressed um, a commitment to the importance of the child tax credit, which has dramatically lowered child poverty. Well, this is good news. I, I'm, I'm understanding you to say that the president will support extending these policies in the child tax, in the TCJA that would result in an increase in taxes on people making under $400,000. Uh, I'd also like to follow up, however, on the president's uh, serious uh, proposals for increasing taxes on the corporate rate. Uh, the bottom line there is if, if the president's proposal to increase the corporate tax rate to 28% is adopted, it'll make it the highest, the second highest combined corporate rate in the world, which will again re result in corporate inversions, capital leaving the United States, increased uh, tax, increased prices for Americans, adding on to inflation, and reduced wages. Is the president seriously considering uh, causing those kinds of economic impacts when we need to have our economy stay strong and have our wage growth be vibrant. I agree with you that we need 
um, a strong economy, and we would not want to see capital flee from the United States to foreign shores. That's the reason for supporting the OECD's um, tax pact, which many countries, uh, including the UK, uh, Japan, um, the European Union, and others are now putting into effect. They're putting into effect a 15% minimum um, tax on multinational so corporations. Let me, let, me, let me move to the OECD now, because as you know, uh, the budget once again proposes to align U.S. global minimum tax with s certain aspects of Pillar 2, but proposes a much more onerous version of it, including a rate 40% higher than the OECD deal, which is 21% versus 15%, and without any substance-based exclusion as provided under the deal. Last year, the administration's budget estimated that that proposal, <coughs> combined with one adopting Pillar 2's under-tax profits rule, would raise over a trillion dollars. But this year's budget estimates for those two combined proposals come in at more than half a trillion dollars lower. Is the year-over-year -year $500 billion estimated decrease a result of countries adopting Pillar 2 rules into law over the last year? Um, yes, in a sense, when standard procedure is to estimate what the tax savings or um, expense would be um, under the assumption the United States adopts a policy but does not assume that everyone else does. So when there are changes abroad, it does change the estimates. Well, my time's expiring. I'll just say that the JCT has estimated that if both the rest of the world and the U.S. enact Pillar 2 next year, the U.S. would lose over $50 billion in revenue. This is a revenue loser for America and is damaging to our economy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Menendez. Uh, I'm pleased to have supported the American Rescue Plan, which restored the child tax credit to offer vital assistance to diligent, hardworking families. This expansion aids children from diverse backgrounds and supports communities where parents face disproportionate representation in low-wage positions due to systemic discrimination and other obstacles to advancement. With additional expansion, approximately 16 million children could see benefits within the initial year with over one-third of all black and Latino children under 17 seeing benefits as well. So Secretary Yellen is expanding the child tax credit, a way to create more economic stability for eligible families, and isn't having monthly payments as a way in which it's ultimately paid out a critical element of reducing child poverty? Yes, I believe the child tax <laughs> credit um, has been, and if um, expanded in the future would reduce child poverty absolutely dramatically. In 2021, when we had monthly payments, that was something that the IRS, in spite of all of the funding shortage it had um, and difficulties, quickly put into effect very effectively. Um, what we saw was that 5.3 million people moved out of poverty and including 2.9 million children. And um, so there it, were... It, cl it we clearly is a, one thing that government can do. Absolutely. That can dramatically help uh, particularly children get out of poverty. So I look forward to the chairman's bill being brought to the floor. Currently, 43 million people have outstanding student debt, totaling 1.6 trillion which keeps hardworking Americans from achieving financial security. Previously, student uh, loan debt that was canceled was considered taxable income by the IRS, and thus individuals who received debt cancellation would face a large surprise tax bill, which undermines the importance uh, of loan forgiveness in the first place. I'm proud of have had my Student Loan Tax Relief Act included as part of the American Rescue Plan. That provision made any college loan forgiveness tax-free, ensuring borrowers whose debt is fully or partially forgiven are hit with thousands of dollars in surprise tax, or for, ensuring that doesn't happen. But the provision sunsets in 2025, and I'm worried that any forgiven student debt in the future will result in a burdensome tax bill. So, Madam Secretary, isn't it just common sense 
to have canceled student debt be considered tax-free? Um, certainly the administration was supportive of that, and I don't know that they've taken a position going forward, but um, President Biden has felt very strongly about wanting to relieve the burden of this debt. Right, and in, in, in his desire to release debt, which I share, it just doesn't make sense to then have it taxed at the end of the day. So I hope we can extend it. Uh, I was pleased to see that the budget calls for a permanent extension of the new market tax credit. Uh, this credit has brought over $1.4 billion to New Jersey alone, bringing much needed private investment to community development entities that provide loans, investments, and financial counseling to low-income communities across the state. Madam Secretary, what possibilities will making this credit permanent uh, lock uh, in for low and income uh, communities? Well, I think it's a tremendously important tool for bringing much needed investment into communities, especially some of the most, um, the poorest communities that really can benefit from and are suffering from a severe shortage of investment, and we would like to see it made permanent. Well, uh, according to an analysis from the Urban Institute, the new market tax credit leads to the creation of jobs through funding for manufacturing and other businesses, expansion of health care services, construction of housing services for vulnerable populations, and much more. And so uh, if we allow it to lapse, then we will miss out on all of that economic investment, not just for those communities, but for others. Finally, the one disappointment I do have, Mr. Chairman, about this budget uh, is the state and local property tax deduction, which is about middle class families in New Jersey and across the country. Uh, we have not restored it. It was the oldest provision of the tax code. And while it expires next year, I just want to wave the saber to say that when it expires, um, we're going to fight like hell to make sure it doesn't continue to expire. With that, thank you very much, and I give you back eight seconds. Thank you. Senator Grassley. Yeah. Uh, let's start with the president's $5 trillion tax hike and the fact that he says that nobody under 400000 is going to pay anything. And then let's go to the website in your department, Office of Tax Analysis. It provides a distributional analysis for all major taxes. I uh, ask unanimous consent to put this in the record. Without objection, order. This analysis shows that households with income below 310,000 bear approximately 37% of the corporate tax under current law. The fact is that millions of middle class Americans with 401ks or IRAs here bear the burden of the corporate taxes, as do workers in the form of lower wages. So my question, based on Treasury's own analysis of the corporate tax burden, isn't it true middle class Americans will shoulder the burden of the president's tax hike to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars? So I think what the impact when you change taxes on corporations, what the impact is on families involves um, a lot of channels that are speculative. They are included um, in models that sometimes the Treasury uses for the purpose of analysis, but um, a, in a tax that is levied on corporations um, that has no obvious direct effect on households, I don't believe the president would regard as raising taxes on um, families making under $400,000. Well, we all know that corporations are just a tool to pass through taxes to either management, consumers, or workers. And uh, I think that uh, it, it's uh, realistic to say that the president's tax uh, is going to hit people with either lower wages or uh, salaries, or the consumers are going to pay it. I think if you look at the entire budget and the president's overall program, what you will see is a budget that not only reduces the deficit by about $3 trillion, but also invests 
in our economy in ways that um, especially benefit low-income workers and the middle class. Um, it reflects an approach I've called modern supply-side economics, which is already showing itself to be tremendously yeah. effective yeah. in okay. generating uh, investment right. in our economy we and hear. is creating I, jobs I wanna, all I throughout wanna, the I country. I want to move on. The president's budget purports to stabilize the national debt as a share of the economy at levels that rival World War II records. Uh, even the Bloomberg editorial board, in a recent article that expressed support for much of the president's agenda, questioned the administration's math. This is because the budget relies on rosy economic and interest rate assumptions, along with many other gimmicks. Uh, this includes assuming the 2017 tax law expires, which would mean $2 trillion tax hike on those earning under 400000 a direct violation of the president's pledge. Rather than being fiscally responsible, doesn't the president's budget, by making no real effort to address runaway spending and the middle class uh, up uh, up for a larger tax hikes down the road? Isn't that what I, the budget does? Well, I would strongly disagree with that description of the budget. First of all, the economic assumptions, if anything, um, are less optimistic than current data suggests. Um, economic growth is proven stronger, the labor market stronger than uh, is reflected in our economic assumptions. Um, the economic assumptions yeah. do show um, a rise in interest rates, which does impact um, debt service cost. But the most important metric of sustainability of fiscal policy is real net interest just paid on the debt, and that um, is stabilized in the president's just, just budget. Let, let me sum it up this way. Uh, you're, you're telling us much more optimistic than what we hear from our own Congressional Budget Office. Well, the time of the gentleman has expired. Um, Senator Cassidy is next. Hey, Madam Secretary, thank you for being here. <coughs> Madam Secretary, um, as we know, Social Security goes insolvent in eight to nine years. The President has not put out a plan. He's put out a series of talking points. He calls them general principles, but there's nothing detailed in that report. And in it, he very loudly is saying that he's going to raise taxes on those over 400000 a year, as he said four years ago when he was campaigning for office the first time, but he's still not updated. Now, I'll note that there's already been $4.9 trillion in new taxes proposed for those making over $400,000 a year. It seems to be the go-to place, fill in the blank, we're going to tax those over 400000 a year for whatever. Of that $4.9 trillion, none of that has been dedicated to Social Security. So with that context, if you are going to address the unfunded accrued liability for Social Security, what would the tax rate have to be, or what would the total amount of taxes have to be on those making over $400,000 a year? I don't have that, com that computation to offer you, but the President has in the past discussed the possibility of uh, raising the ceiling on um, what income would be included. Of course, he would protect those, his pledges to protect households making um, under $400,000. Because the president theoretically has a plan. And if I'm rubbing my forehead, it's just because it seems worse than I thought. If there's not been a computation, if there's not been a calculation of what the tax rate would have to be on those making over $400,000 a year. Has, a, has, he, has Treasury really not looked at, okay, we're already charging $4.9 trillion for the deficit, for Medicare, for a lot of other things, and now we've got to add social, but we haven't done the math to figure out how much that tax rate the, would have to the be? The president doesn't have a plan. He has principles. He wants to work with Congress to find a way um, to protect Social Security and extended solvency. 
beyond 2034. Now, if, the wishes, if the president wishes to work with Congress, why does he continually demagogue Republicans on anything that doesn't exactly line up to what apparently suits his reelection? And if I'm frustrated, there's going to be a 23 to 25 percent cut for those receiving benefits now, which will double the rate of poverty among the elderly, double the rate of poverty among the elderly in eight years, and he doesn't have a plan. Madam Secretary, how could he justify not having a plan when he's been in office for three years already? He believes it's important to work with Congress and, and not Madam Secretary, he has not worked with us at all. On this Senate Finance Committee, we have not heard, at least I haven't, and I've been very active in this issue, we've not heard from the President one peep except to hear demagoguery rhetoric on uh, yelled at us on State of the Union addresses as regards social. Uh, so can the American people who rely upon Social Security, when can they expect the president to come to us and ask to begin to work on that plan? Well, the president has laid out a plan for Medicare. That's not my question. Which is... He's, which, he's laid out general principles, as you said earlier, but he's certainly not come to us and said, "This is, I want to be, enter negotiations. It, it is true that um, he's started with Medicare at the hospital. So then let me ask you on that. On Medicare... Uh, there is a certain ratio of public funds supporting Medicare relative to the trust fund. And when it exceeds a certain threshold, it's called an emergency. And within 15 days, the president is supposed to submit a plan. Uh, it, last year, uh, we hit that threshold. This year, we hit it again. Uh, and I've not seen the president's plan submitted. The president uh, did lay out a plan for Medicare. It involves... Um, extending trust fund solvency by uh, modestly increasing Medicare tax rates on incomes above $400,000 and then closing loopholes in existing Medicare taxes. Did, did the, the president, I'm sorry, did the president include the SMI in that plan? The SMI covering parts B and D? I don't think he covered B and the, D. This that. is with respect to the hospital trust fund. Yes, so Medicare, of course, as we know, also includes parts B and D, and the funding in the, the cost of those, which is enti almost entirely out of general fund, about 85% out of general fund, is going to exceed expenditures from the hospital trust fund. The president's plan did not include those two areas. <laughs> I, I'm a doctor. I know how important people, how important Medicare is. And the president has not submitted a plan for that which is the fastest growing portion of the plan in order to address it. Madam, Pres uh, Madam Secretary, this has been a very disappointing performance by a man who wants to once more be our president for the next four years on two programs incredibly important to our seniors. With that, I yield. Um, I believe the president has laid out a plan for the hospital trust fund, and he's laid out a budget that in contains $3 trillion of a deficit reduction and um, that provides enough general revenues to be able to support the expenditures that are projected for uh, Part B. Madam Secretary, welcome. Uh, in your testimony, you, you repeat what uh, OMB Director Young also said, that uh, the President's budget reduced the deficit by $3 trillion. Um, President Obama, in his final budget, fiscal year 2017, his cumulative deficit was about $6 trillion. Uh, four years later, in President Trump's final budget for fiscal year 2021, his cumulative, def cumulative deficit over 10 years was $5.6 trillion. I mean, neither one of those presidents ever projected a deficit more than a trillion dollars. President Biden came into office. He has yet to produce a budget where he proposed a deficit less than $1.3 trillion. So we went from President Trump's budget in fiscal year 2021 of $5.6 trillion. A year later, President Biden projected a, a 10-year deficit of $14.5 trillion. The following year, another $14.4 trillion. Last year's budget, he was projecting $17 trillion of 10-year cumulative, cumulative deficit. This budget now is $16.3 trillion. Now, I, I see President Biden's budget going up $8 trillion over Trump's, 
then going up another three trillion over his own budget, and now coming down a trillion less than, la not even a trillion, about $700 billion less. Where do you come up with saving $3 trillion in deficit? Well, that's a straightforward calculation, which is compares the budget that he's proposed with the baseline that would exist if well, Madam, current Madam again, continues. The, again, the baseline he came in with was $5.6 trillion. He bumped that baseline to $14.5 trillion, maintained the $14.5 trillion, bumped that to $17 trillion, so he increased it $3 trillion, I guess brought it down $700 billion. Again, where do you get a $3 trillion reduction in deficit, other than just m making it up, pulling it out of thin air, which is what you've done? Well, the, pr the president is not pulling it out of thin air. He's proposed hey, well, a so number where, of where's savings. The where's the calculation? Get, tell me how you calculate a $3 trillion decrease in the deficit when you go from $5.6 trillion to $14.5, $14.5, $17, and now $16. Where, where is a $3 trillion reduction in deficit ever shown in the president's own budgets? Well, I think if you look at the budget and you examine the tables, um, the Table I'm, I'm looking at the budget. I got the numbers okay, here. I'm going to count. I, I, do too. I can do table, the math. Table S3 gives the budget baseline, and um, then the the um, base uh, what, table S4 gives the again, proposed the, budget, so, and sorry. you compare those two, and you'll see exactly well, okay, I, I, where so these numbers Provide come me that from. calculation, please, okay? I, okay I'd like to see that because I'm giving the numbers here, so I'd appreciate that calculation. Well, let, let me ask you a question. Do you know how much the federal government spent in total only four years ago in fiscal year 2019? Well, that was pre-pandemic. I, I, I realize have, that. I don't have that number in front of me, but. Okay, well, it was $4.4 trillion. You know, you know how much the federal, how much U.S. population has grown since that point in time? A few percent. Yeah, couple, less, less than 2 percent. Do you know how much you're proposing, what percent increase in your proposing spending next year? We went up you know, from $4.4 trillion, $4 trillion, population grew at 2 percent. Do you know what percent the population, increase? The population aged. And because you're, you're, we have an Senator older Johnson, population spending on your, your, your Social budget, Security, yeah, the, the, Medicare. The answer to the question is you're increasing spending 63%. Three, tr almost $3 trillion over what we spent, 4.4 up to $7.3 trillion. How can you justify that? Senator Johnson, let's let we, the Secretary answer your question. Well, the President has proposed a budget that I regard as fiscally respons responsible. It, um, you, you are looking at one metric, which is the dollar value of the deficit. I think a more relevant economic measure is real net interest as a share of GDP. We have a strongly growing economy with a much larger GDP. And if you look at table S1, you'll see that the proposed budget stabilizes real net interest over 10 years at an historically normal level. And the president's budget um, helps Americans lower costs that are tremendously burdensome, burdensome to them. It um, provides adequate funding to the Internal Revenue Service so that they can um, collect taxes that are due and shrink what is an utterly enormous tax gap amounting to about $150 billion a year. The, 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 the president's Bennett. massive deficit spending has caused the value of a dollar to decrease from a dollar to 85 cents during his administration. The That's the, what the president's budget the is The time about. of the gentleman's expired. Senator Bennett. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here. Thank you for your testimony. And I, I also want to say thank you very much. Uh, I'm not going to ask you any questions about it today, but thank you very much for working with us on the Colorado Tabor issues and the other issues that we've raised. I feel like we're constantly pounding on your uh, door for help, and uh, you've, you've been very willing to 
um, to help understand the situations that we're facing, including our effort to try to protect working families in Colorado from uh, from tax increases as a result of a different opinion about Tabor. So thank you for that. Um, you know, it might surprise people here to say that I worry a little bit about the rise in interest rates and what that's going to mean in terms of um, our ability to be able to uh, uh, not just deal with our deficits, but also um, uh, make sure we don't erode uh, substantially the discretionary spending that we have. And we've had 10 years or more of 0% interest rates, which I think uh, is the result in part of, of, of and we might disagree about this, Madam Secretary, but I would say overly aggressive monetary policy from the Fed that kept rates at zero for probably longer than they should have, and, and with an expansive quantitative easing that I think had the effect of driving a, a, a problematic in, uh, income inequality as a result, or, or wealth inequality, I guess I should say, as a result of the appreciation of asset prices here. And I think we're sort of dealing with the back end of that now, and it's worrisome. But things are going to set in um, at a more normalized rate for families and for the federal government. And there, the young people around here have never seen an interest rate environment, really, uh, that was the that was more normal, you know, like 4% or 5%. I mean, they've seen 0% for a decade. That's not the way it used to be, and that's not the way it will be, and I think that that's not the way our economy should run. And I think we are at a moment where we need to think about how we bring in line, you know, better in line our revenues and our expenditures. One of the things that drives me crazy, though, and I never hear it from my colleague uh, who was banging on this uh, 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 dais a few minutes ago, is the degree to which tax cuts for the wealthiest people in America uh, have created the you know so much of the deficit situation that we've that we're dealing with. I mean, the, take the Bush tax cuts, take the Trump tax cuts, and 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 I think more than sixty percent of the the delta that he's talking about in terms of our deficit is is the result of of those tax cut provisions. And most wealthy people I know, they might like to have tax cuts. They might philosophically believe that tax cuts are good. But they certainly don't need the money. And when I think about things like the child tax credit, which cut childhood poverty in half uh, in this country, um, it has, I, w I would argue, enormous fiscal benefits as well as just moral benefits. Um, it just seems crazy to me to, that we're continuing to use this trickle-down economics as, a, as an argument to borrow a whole bunch of money uh, to give the wealthiest people in America Tax cuts. I mean, think about this, Mr. Chairman. When you take the Bush tax cuts and the Trump tax cuts together, about a quarter of those cuts went to the top 1% of Americans. About a quarter of those cuts. That's about $2.5 trillion that went to the top 1% of Americans. That's 1.6 million people. Americans in the bottom quintile, you know, that's 10 million people, by the way, 10 million versus the people at the very top. 10 million, they got $100 billion out of that deal, of those two deals. So could you talk a little bit about that, Madam Secretary, the way in which, you know, if you, I guess, were helping set the priorities in this country, maybe if you were being fiscally responsible, the first thing you, you might not do is cut taxes for the very wealthiest people in America without borrowing, without, without paying for a single cent of it. I, I completely agree. And if you look at CBO calculations, um, look at what was projected in terms of tax collections. Um, I believe that in 2017, before TCJA passed, CBO was projecting revenues would be about 18% of GDP, and instead they were about 16.5% last year, and um, CBO is projecting around 17%. So a significant part of the deficit comes from that, and what President Biden is proposing to do is to ask wealthy people, high-income people, to pay their fair share. Um, it's important that they be successful, that we have an economy that um, people can 
um, invent things and run businesses and earn healthy profits, but then they need to pay their fair share. And with uh, tax rates on dividends and capital gains that are lower than many people pay on ordinary income, with step up of basis, with no taxation of unrealized capital gains, um, the wealthy pay, um, I, I believe a recent calculation shows that some of the very wealthiest people pay on average about 8% of their uh, total incomes in taxes, and that should be remedied, and it provides um, a very ample pool to invest in our economy and to grow the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. Thanks. As Thank much you. as I agree with Senator Bennett, we've got to move on. Senator Blackburn, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, thank you so much for your time today. I do want to get to the budget. Before I do, I want to ask about Treasury's activities and your activities with Communist China. And I'm so concerned about what appears to be appeasement coming from Treasury. And of course, we know China has uh, practiced intellectual property theft. You've got the genocide that is taking place against the Uyghurs there in Xinjiang. And the Trump administration had sanctioned the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps because they're a paramilitary organization with a 50% stake in more than 2,800 Chinese companies. And what we have received is reports that under your leadership at Treasury, that you all have not fully enforced these sanctions or issued new sanctions against subsidiaries of this entity. And that is disturbing. So I would like to know what specific actions you're taking to ensure that the Chinese Communist Party entity is sanctioned to the fullest extent of the law? And what are you doing to identify individuals and entities to sanction, to put further pressure on Communist China for its ongoing genocide and its crimes against humanity? Well, I absolutely agree with you okay. that um, Treasury and the Biden administration um, should be sanctioning human rights violations that are occurring in Xinjiang. And there is no appeasement, I want to assure you, okay. on this matter. If you're aware of some specific matter that you uh, th we'll think be happy to involves a problem, reports. I will put yeah. you in touch with my uh, your staff in touch with mine okay. to try to clarify what we're doing. But there hasn't been, okay. to the best of my knowledge, any weakening of these sanctions. Okay. We take well, them Treasury, seriously. Treasury sits on the Force Labor Enforcement Task Force and has the ability to make recommendations for Chinese entities to be added to the Uyghur Force Labor Prevention Act entity list. Currently, the majority of entities were put on the list by the Departments of Commerce and Homeland Security. And you have broad capabilities for identifying bad actors, such as through the Office of Foreign Asset Control. Yet Treasury has not made recommendations for new actors to be added to the entity list. So as you review this, if you could let me know why you have not and what you plan to do about that, that would be helpful. I would be glad to get you a briefing on it, but I do want to emphasize that uh, these human rights violations are a very serious concern and our sanctions and use of our authorities yes. are intended. And we would like to see those used to the full extent of the law. And it's disturbing to hear that they are not. Let me ask you one other thing. It is National Ag Week. And I just um, was talking to some of our producers in Tennessee. U.S. ag exports dropped by $17 billion last year. And China did not live up to their ag purchase. We hear this from our soy and our cotton farmers in Tennessee. And there were some great provisions put in place under President, President Trump's phase one deal. 
So have you or your staff raised this to Chinese officials in your meetings? Um, yes. Um, U.S. Trade Representative has um, tried to hold China to the agreement to carry out uh, the commitments that they made. China has failed to do so, and we have not lowered um, any of the tariffs that we've put in place. And I think, as you're aware, we've taken many other actions uh, to deal with unfair uh, okay. Chinese practices, including threats to our national yes. security. Yes. Madam Secretary, I will send you this in writing, but I do want to talk to you about Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, because the cost to the U.S. on Pillar 1 is $1.4 billion, and the revenue loss from Pillar 2 is estimated to be in the range of 60 to 120 billion, and that's a joint tax number. And we're very concerned about that. You look at that, and then you look at what is happening with ag products, and we're quite concerned about where these actions are taking us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank, uh, thank my colleague. And uh, um, Madam Secretary, would you like to give a quick response? I know we're staying within five minutes, or would you like to just get back to uh, my colleague well, in writing. I could give a brief response Great. on pillar one, if that's okay. Um, we're attempting to negotiate in the OECD a pillar one agreement that will bring significant benefits to American businesses that have been hit with unfair and discriminatory um, tax burdens in many parts of the world. We're really trying to eliminate that. And we're also trying to get tax certainty for American companies that face significant dis and costly disputes about transfer pricing and other matters. There would be substantial benefits to American businesses from this agreement if we conclude it. Our own internal estimate um, is, there's a lot of uncertainty, but our own internal estimate is about $500 million. And I think in the grand scheme of things, when you um, look at what the benefits are for the United States, that that needs to be evaluated. We, we've not concluded a deal and are not ready to um, bring it to you. The time, the time to my you, colleague but, has uh, expired, I know we'll be talking a lot about this in the days ahead. Senator Langford. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I would hope that we would spend a lot more time talking about Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 in the days ahead. Uh, let me just do a quick follow-up question on that. Uh, Secretary Yellen, the Pillar 1, Pillar 2 agreements, are these planned to be an executive agreement only, or is it planned to be able to come through this committee, anything on the tax policy issues for the Finance Committee, congressionally required, constitutionally required, to be able to have a tax issue for an American entity to actually come through Congress, or do you plan this to be executive only? I mean, I believe a Pillar 1 agreement would involve congressional action. It's not something that could be um, just signed into law and effective with an executive order. It Pillar 1 or 2 or either Excuse of me? them? Excuse me? Either Pillar 1 or 2, either Pil 1? Pillar 2 also needs to be adopted by Congress. Right. Thank we you. Propose that. We, we, you. You talked about just a, American business having uncertainty. That This is an issue right now, obviously, that people don't know what the tax policy is and don't know if it's going to even come through this committee. And it's good to be able to hear the plan is whatever agreement, whatever its requirement is done is your intention actually. We bring will it bring Congress. it to Congress. And we have tried to keep um, this committee in, informed on a bipartisan basis. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, the uh, IDCs, I uh, noticed in the budget, the intangible drilling costs uh, for oil and gas production. I thought it was interesting in the President's budget and the proposal, uh, every other business in America that does manufacturing can deduct their normal business expenses. But in the President's proposal, it is except oil and gas production. They cannot and should not be able to deduct normal business expenses. Is there a reason why those particular manufacturing locations should not be able to deduct normal business expenses and every other manufacturer in the country should? Well, in general, um, subsidies to fossil fuels 
are something that the president um, right, but looks th th to this phase This is not out. a subsidy. An intangible drilling cost is not a subsidy. That's the cost of actual production. That's the cost of all the equipment, of everything else around it. That's not a subsidy. Every, every manufacturing business can write off their normal business expenses. I guess my question is, why do those manufacturers not get to write off their business expenses and everyone else does? Just because um, the fossil fuel industries have benefited from many subsidies over many years that um, makes it difficult for uh, clean energy to um, be taken up. Well, I, I noticed recently that Treasury and the State Department have reduced the sanctions on Venezuela and that we're now buying oil from Venezuela when we weren't for the last four years. So I guess my question is, the President's proposal is to make it harder to produce American energy, but there's still an acknowledgement that we need oil still. And so now we're buying oil from Venezuela when previously we weren't. If you go back two years ago, even the first two years of the Biden administration, we're not buying any oil from Venezuela, knowing that it's the Maduro regime and all that they're doing to their people. But there's a proposal to increase taxes on American companies, but buy more for Venezuela. Why would that be? Um, the relief that was put into place reflected um, progress that seemed to be made in Venezuela um, in response in respect to our foreign policy would that be uh, the, goals for would that be the same with Iran because I know for some of the Iranian sanctions there was a there was 20 New York Times reported 27 tankers were then insured by an American company they were able to be able to bring in Iranian put Iranian oil on the world market when we had pretty strict sanctions on Iran we before. have very strict we have very strict sanctions on Iran and um, I'm not aware of anything that we do okay. that um, is permissive in terms of Iranian oil exports. I, I, I'll have my team share this New York Times article with you uh, that detailed out how Iran is avoiding American sanctions and it's not as tight as it was and that there are even American companies providing insurance for Iranian tankers moving oil now we, we in a are, way that wasn't in the past. Well, I'd be happy to look at it, but we are very focused on trying to um, impose the strictest yeah. possible regime as, as well Iran. we should the iranian proxies have attacked american forces 200 times and have taken the lives of americans uh, even in the last few months one, one last question just on one of the uh, 30d clean vehicle credits that is out there i know the president's been very focused on the made in america requirements he talked about that during the state of the union speech we had testimony sitting at that same table just a few days ago of an american company that is producing a product or was attempting to produce a product, but China got a waiver from Treasury for a product that was coming in, and so the American company dropped it and said, we're not gonna do it anymore because Treasury gave a waiver to the Chinese product to be able to go in and get this 30D clean vehicle credit. It seems to be a gap still that Treasury is giving waivers to some Chinese companies that literally undercut an American company in production. It's one that I'm not going to try to have you walk through because you couldn't have known that, but literally sitting at that table just a few days ago was an American company saying, I'm having to struggle with the Treasury right now because they're giving waivers to Chinese companies. I, I'm not aware of any waiver that we have given. Um, their 30D has... Um, foreign entity of concern restrictions. Right. They're coming into play this year and next, and they essentially make it impossible for any electric vehicle to qualify for the 30D credit if they contain um, minerals that are uh, extracted or processed in China or battery components right. that are produced there. And that's a very stringent sure. requirement we'll, that's we'll, coming we'll, we'll out. Time, the time of the gentleman's expired. I'm going to put in to the uh, record at the, of the hearing that our technology neutrality requirements give everybody in the energy field an opportunity to get rewards for reducing carbon emissions. Senator Cardin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Yellen, welcome. Pleasure Thank to you. have you here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the President's budget as it relates to affordable housing. We have a shortage of affordable housing in the country, so the stock itself is one of concerns. There's a challenge on affordability. 
issues generally for housing. And then there's the wealth gap in America in which housing can help fill the wealth gap. So I've introduced, along with Senator Young, bipartisan legislation, the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act. It's included in the President's budget. And I just want to give you an opportunity to talk about the priority in the budget as it relates to affordable housing. So the President and our administration have been very focused on the burdens that American families face because in so many parts of the country, it's impossible to find affordable housing. So many households um, find themselves spending half or more of their income just to put a roof over their heads. And so uh, the president's budget contain a package of proposals to increase the supply of affordable housing. Uh, the one that he focused on um, most in the State of the Union would provide uh, first-time home buyers as well as sellers of potential sellers of starter homes um, who, because they may have very low interest mortgages, are reluctant to sell these homes and create a supply on the market. Um, this would um, create tax credits that would stimulate and make it easier for first time home buyers uh, to do that. In addition, there's a neighborhood homes credit that um, would provide a credit for builders and homeowners that are seeking to rehabilitate um, homes and encourage residential uh, development in neighbor neighborhoods in communities where property values are low. Yeah, I'm very pleased to, to be working with Senator Young on that. I, I want to just compliment Senator Wyden. I want to thank you very much for including affordable housing in the tax package that hopefully we'll be able to get on the floor. But we need to do more, and I just uh, pre appreciate the President's budget on this. And another one of those tools is the new market tax credits. I know Senator Menendez has talked about that. The permanency of that credit would give predictability to investors, and it's included also in the President's budget. I work with Senator Daines on that, and I hope that we'll be able to get that done also. And I want to just compliment the administration for including that provision uh, in, in, their, in their budget. I, I want to ask you one more question about uh, Secure 2.0, the retirement bill that passed last year. It has uh, a very important provision in regards to the savers credit refundability. Now, I know we're still a couple years away from its implementation, but I want to make sure we stay on schedule. So can you give us some assurances that the implementation of Secure 2.0, particularly as it relates to those provisions that are particularly important for low-income family, working families, uh, how that's coming along? It's an important provision. Um, the IRS is and Treasury have already started preparing for implementation in 2027. They've convened a working group that has experienced staff. There are a number of technical rules, IRS system issues, um, and external communications. Uh, this group meets informally, regularly. Uh, they meet with outside stakeholder groups um, to try to get a better handle on what they need to do to be ready for 2027 when it goes in effect. I appreciate if you keep us informed as to how that is being implemented. And lastly, let me just ask you about the implementation of the production tax credit in regards to uh, nuclear power production, uh, the 45U. 45U. Yeah. How um, that is coming along? We, we are working on rules on that. I can't give you a definite date at which um, we expect to get that rule out, but it is um, part of our work program. We're, we're investing um, a huge amount of energy in trying to get out the rules associated with the green, green tax credits and IRA. Thank you. Thank my colleague. I would just say to colleagues on both sides, if everybody sticks to the five-minute rule, we can get everybody in. Senator Daines. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, Secretary Yellen, good to have you here today. Uh, 
my observation has been the administration has a pattern of saying one thing and doing something else, and that's creating harm for Montanans. First, you said inflation was transitory. I remember being right here in the same room when you said the inflation was transitory, and we were challenging that assumption. And then we had Biden inflation's 40-year high-level cost the average taxpayer $34,000 in lost wages and wiped out over 26 million low-income earners' life savings. Finally, it took severe economic hardship for you to admit the truth, and that was the inflation that you said was transitory did not, in fact, end up being transitory, just like members of your own party predicted Next, the Americans were assured sky-high interest rates driven by President Biden's out-of-control spending would go back to normal. But just last week, you admitted these rates would most likely never come down to the level seen in the prior administration. Then, you and President Biden enacted the so-called Inflation Reduction Act to, in this administration's terms, finally force businesses, and I'm using your terms, to pay what you all believe to be their fair share. This is the same Inflation Reduction Act that every single Senate Democrat voted for and is now funding projects to make our border more green rather than more secure. It's funding projects for all electric buildings, solar panels, EV chargers at the border. Finally, the Biden budget unveiled a slew of additional tax increases, tax hikes on American companies, delivering yet another blow to taxpayers. For years, President Biden has vowed no tax increase on individuals earning less than $400,000. But the truth is this administration has already broken that promise. Inflation is a tax on all Americans. High interest rates have kept families from buying homes and hindered the growth of small businesses. And now President Biden is choosing to let the Tax Cut and Jobs Act expire and increase the corporate tax rate, forcing American families and workers to bear the cost of these woke policies. Secretary Yellen, are you refuting the evidence showing that both an increased corporate rate and letting TCGA expire increase taxes on those earning less than $400,000? The, pres the president is pledged that he will not raise taxes on anyone making under $400,000. And when TCGA, um, the individual income tax uh, provisions in it, expire at the end of 2025. He wants to work to make sure that households earning under $400,000 do not see an increase in their tax bills. Well, I'll take that as a no and I'll move on. Perhaps the most egregious fiscal decision we've seen for the administration is the complete dereliction of duty to the disastrous OECD Pillars 1 and 2 negotiations. You completely bypassed Congress's authority and entered into a terrible deal that will harm the competitiveness of U.S. businesses. The role of the Treasury Secretary is, according to your website, to enable economic growth, stability, and to create job opportunities. I assume that's American job opportunities. These negotiations do the direct opposite of each of those. Through unprecedented extraterritorial taxes, you've bargained a deal that would not only raise taxes on U.S. companies, but also send that money overseas to communist China and line the pockets of European bureaucrats. This does completely disregard your role as Treasury Secretary and uses American companies as a piggy bank for foreign governments. According to the Joint Committee on Taxation, both <coughs> Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, again, according to the JCT, lose revenue. Can you provide justification for supporting this deal? 
And, I absolutely and Madam, Madam Secretary, just excuse me. We have an equal number of Democrats and Republicans in the queue. So when you're uh, done okay. uh, giving your response, we're going to move on. Okay. Well, I strongly disagree with the way you've characterized the impact of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Pillar 2 is an historic agreement that, ra that ends the race to the bottom we've seen around the world in corporate tax rates. Um, it levels the playing field. The United States uh, to date has been the only country with a uh, minimum tax so do, do, on do multinational foreign earnings. Uh, foreign do, do, earnings. Do you refute the JCT data that says it loses revenue? I, I think you hit, we need to, I don't want to answer that because there are several things to take into account. <laughs> Our estimate is that Pillar 2 um, and the UTPR that goes with it uh, results in a big increase in <clears throat> tax revenue for the U.S. The time of the gentleman's expired. Senator Carper. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Madam uh, Secretary. Thank you for a lifetime of service to our country. It's great to, uh, to see you. Thank the, you so um, much. Pretty cold uh, crisp morning here in our uh, nation's capital. But we uh, know that last summer was the uh, hottest summer on the year. Last year was the hottest year on record. And uh, we know what's causing it. It's too much uh, carbon uh, uh, and other uh, uh, similar uh, kinds of uh, substance in, in the air leading to uh, the, uh, uh, global warming. The, as it turns out, one of the best ways to address it, we're doing a lot of good stuff. Methane emission reduction programs, um, HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons, uh, you know, stepping them down, uh, electric vehicles, um, gosh, diesel emission reduction act legislation, a lot of things that we've passed and are, are implementing. The um, uh, one of the uh, one of the things that can help us a whole lot is hydrogen, the hydrogen hubs, and we're all over that, and the administration is all over that, and I think it's a pretty good bipartisan issue. But uh, the, uh, the you know the, the treasury I, I help write Senator Wyden and I help write uh, with the help of a few members of our staff uh, a, a provision called 45V for hydrogen hydrogen, and uh, the idea is to to produce more hydrogen to help us decarbonize our our economy. But um, treasury has uh, cons has let me just ask has treasury considered uh, how its uh, 45V proposed rule affects the domestic supply chain for clean hydrogen components needed to achieve what we would call a liftoff with respect to the hydrogen to really get us rolling on producing more hydrogen to meet our decarbonization needs. Has, uh, has Treasury considered how its 45V proposed rule, if you will, the guidance that you guys have, uh, have been working on, how uh, it will affect domestic supply chain for clean hydrogen components needed to achieve a liftoff the, the, on the hydrogen side? Well, we did put out a proposed rule for 45V. We worked very closely with the Department of Energy and EPA um, in order to craft a rule that um, would make sure that companies qualifying for the largest credit were really producing hydrogen in ways that would result in, would greatly diminish um, emissions that, that was truly clean and would not have indirect effects in boosting um, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there were some difficult areas. We have asked for guidance on a number of um, contentious matters. And um, we're trying to now go through and review some of the guidance that we have received and continue Good. working. If you have particular yeah, we have. views. Senator, Senator Wyden and I have met with your folks and, and, uh, and others of the administration to say these are our concerns. This is what we're hearing from the folks who are producing hydrogen, want to produce hydrogen in order for them to be successful and for our hydrogen hubs to work. So let me just, I just want to plant that. That sounds like you're on We, That's we good. would be happy to work with you on good. that. Thank you. We appreciate that. Uh, as you, as you, uh, 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 finalize the guidance as relates to what I just asked, but how is Treasury considering the impact of hydrogen tax credit on the viability and success of these hydrogen hubs and we're creating these hydrogen hubs around the country to create a lot of hydrogen to help meet our hydrogen needs. We can uh, um, uh, we can use hydrogen for 
Uh, gosh, we can use it for sure. ca cars, trucks, vans, airplanes, all kinds of stuff. Uh, we can use it for producing uh, electricity. Uh, we can uh, use it for manufacturing operations. So it's huge, it can be hugely helpful in this battle. But uh, my question would be, how is Treasury considering the impact of hydrogen tax credit on the viability and success of hydrogen hubs that we're creating? Well, I, I think many of the hubs um, will be able to meet the requirements in order to um, qualify for uh, the largest credit. Um, there are some issues around uh, those that uh, are relying on nuclear. Uh, a question is what is the impact of um, allowing nuclear to be uh, used uh, in the hubs when it's nuclear um, is already being supplied onto the grid. Um, uh, we're required yeah. to take to, account of indirect to, to emissions. Your, to your point, we could use nuclear to, for, uh, uh, in the process of creating hydrogen. We can use, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, water, what, hydro. We can use hydro uh, to create, to, through electrolysis to, uh, electrolysis to create hydrogen. And we just want to make sure at the end of the day we have, we have the uh, guidance from Treasury that will enable that to help. Thank you. And thanks again for all your service and your, thank, your good work. Thank you very much, thanks for coming Senator. and testifying today. Thank you, Senator thank you. Carper. Now, in order of appearance, uh, the next three would be Senator Brown, uh, Senator Barrasso, and Senator Whitehouse, so that members uh, know the order. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Madam Secretary, nice to see you again. And I, whenever I see you, I think about the most important work um, I've done in this body and your help with that, the child tax credit, and how you made such a difference in um, 2 million Family, the families of 2 million children in my state and 60 million around the country. So thank you. I'll always be indebted to you for that. Thank I want to ask you, you about Senator. something that I don't agree with you so much, and that's about the proposed Treasury regs that hurt my state dealing with production tax credit for clean hydrogen. I walked in and heard much of what Senator Carper was talking about, and I want to echo his concerns about 45B, 45V, I'm sorry. The proposed rules, what happens when people in Washington who so often don't know, uh, we have no idea about the real world impact in states like Ohio and Michigan and Pennsylvania and what Wisconsin make policy. Ohio's Appalachian Hydrogen Hub or ARCH2 received Department of Energy grant done right. This hub can help create thousands of good paying jobs. The problem, as we've talked, is that hydro Treasury's hydrogen regulations work against this DOE supported project, not for it. 45V proposals undermine the good work done by DOE and frankly this Congress. Treasury regulations would eliminate grandfathering for projects built by 2028 by requiring them to switch to hourly matching. Um, I don't wanna bore my colleagues, but when you build a hydrogen facility, you must decide from the start whether you're qualifying for the credit using the annual matching system everyone already uses or whether using a brand new untested hourly matching system. You can't just flick a switch down the road and flip from one to the other. To be clear, the administration must change course on this. My question, Madam Secretary, will you revise the Treasury regulations to support the Appalachian economy, an economy that's so often left behind by presidents of both parties? and as a compromise allow taxpayers to continue operating their projects in the same manner as before and after any transition date? So the Treasury guidance that we issued in the um, NPRM on 45V um, was developed through extensive consultation with external stakeholders and with experts um, at the Department of Energy and EPA. And the objective here was to advance um, the production of hydrogen with all the benefits um, it offers in the United States, but to make sure that there are environmental safeguards. And um, many companies um, are moving forward with projects that include the safeguards We've asked for comment on various provisions. We've heard concern about uh, hydrogen hubs and um, how they will be treated under this regulation. We welcome feedback and um, you know, we'll listen to the input we get okay, well, as we revise the regulations. Well, thank you, St still isn't good enough, but we'll continue the discussions until, with you and other agencies until 
we get this right. Additional concerns, Mr. Chairman, about the three pillars under 45V, uh, which I'll submit as questions for the record. If I want to talk about 45X, I want to ask about another credit critical to the future of manufacturing. That's the, the 45X advanced manufacturing tax credit. Our tax code must support American manufacturers building out genuine domestic supply chains. We shouldn't give the Chinese Communist Party the chance to exploit tax credits designed to support genuine American manufacturing. I'm working with colleagues from both sides of the aisle to tighten restrictions on the 45X credit to sure, ensure the taxpayer money isn't going to Chinese companies and other uh, the term foreign entities of concern. I'm glad Senator Langford mentioned this earlier. As you prepare 45X regs, will you ensure that companies connected to 45, I'm sorry, connected to foreign entities of concern can't just Im import, this is what they do, import foreign parts, qualify for the credit by merely doing the assembly here? Will you ensure that those companies don't, can't do that? Well, the company is supposed to be receive the credit only if they were producing in the United States. The purpose is um, to benefit U.S. workers and to onshore on supply chains. And so we will try to put in effect rules that um, accomplish that. There are anti-abuse provisions um, that if there really is essentially no uh, production in the United okay. States that I think would capture yeah, that, but thank we you. will that's, be sensitive to that. And that's issue. way more than just the assembly made from parts overseas when the intellectual property stays overseas and all that. Um, 30 more, 15 more seconds, if I could, Mr. Chair, about the House tax, tax bill. Uh, I know that Senator, the Chairman Wyden negotiated that in good faith, uh, brought Senator Carr, Senator um, Crapo and others into the negotiations. We all knew what was going on past the House, 357 to 70. Only three Democrats on the Ways and Means Committee voted no. All the Republicans voted yes. It expends the child tax credit, protects residents of my community, East Palestine, Ohio, from a tax bill. Uh, it contone, contains low-income housing tax credit. Really, really, really supports American manufacturing. With R&D, I, I will submit a question about what those benefits are um, if we pass that and thank the chairman for his I, work I on I thank that. my colleague, and as much as I'd like to continue the conversation, Senator Barrasso, you're up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Secretary, thank you. I uh, just came from the Energy Committee where we're discussing energy for America, which is affordable, available, and reliable for the American people. So energy producers in my home state of Wyoming and across the country are facing a whole of government assault from this administration on that component of energy. President Biden has shown time and time again that he's going to use every tool at his disposal to target the American energy industry. He's making life very difficult for the men and women who are working to provide American families and our allies with affordable, available, reliable energy. And President Biden has recently banned leases for oil and gas. He's halted permitting of natural gas pipelines and storage facilities. Last month, he announced a new export ban on liquefied natural gas. And once again, the Biden administration is proposing more than $110 billion in new tax increases on energy production. Uh, my former colleague, Mike Enzi, used to always talk about a book, and it reminded me of this, listening to Senator Brown. It was called The Hidden America. It says, from coal miners to cowboys, the people who keep the lights on and who keep food on the table, the people that many, many in Americans don't see, don't know about, and the impact that they have on their lives. So th this tax proposal that you and the president have come across is going to deny our energy producers the ability to recover costs associated with the production. Uh, your proposal uh, repeals necessary and ordinary deductions that give producers parity to every other business, large and small in America. And to me, the, the tax code is being weaponized. And under your policies, many energy companies would cease to exist. Uh, these are the very companies that keep the lights on in our homes, that put gas in our cars, provide the building blocks for materials that go into everyday products. So we, what would you say to the small energy producer in Wyoming, for example, who is concerned that they're not going to be able to continue to operate if they can't deduct these expenses? Well, I would say that, um, first of all, we will need oil and gas through a substantial um, transition and um, oil production has, um, I believe, reached new highs. It's um, expanded quite a lot 
over the last um, year or two. Um, but on a long-term basis, clearly the goal is to move to clean energy, which um, is important for reducing greenhouse gas emissions so that we can um, be on a livable planet. And um, we want to make sure that that transition proceeds in a way that we don't destroy the planet in the process. And there have long been tax preferences for oil, gas, and coal that we believe distort markets by encouraging more investment in fossil fuels that would, than would occur under a neutral system. And so there are a set of proposals um, that are intended to level the playing field to um, reduce those advantages that fossil fuel sector has enjoyed and to speed the process of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Also, I would say that this is in, supports energy security because um, in global markets where, although the U.S. plays a significant role, we also have um, countries in the Middle East and Russia um, playing critical roles in the global oil market. Geopolitical events um, can have very significant domestic yeah. spillovers, and we won't experience that when we increase our uh, dependence on uh, wind, solar, hydrogen, um, electric vehicles. Uh, Madam, Madam Secretary, thank you. I appreciate you. And as you are well aware, emissions in the United States have been down and down and down and down and down over the last 15 to 20 years. And it's what's happening around the world where emissions are going up. And I would say we're here buying, all trying to make energy as clean as we can, as fast as we can, and do it in ways that don't raise costs for consumers. Because they're the, ultimately decide, the ultimate deciders about how our country is governed and how we rule and how we move forward. You know, this morning I sent a letter to you and your department signed by 24 senators, I'm sure you haven't seen it yet, yeah, it. Uh, on the energy tax proposals, which I believe are disastrous. Uh, Chairman Wyden, I ask unanimous consent to include this into the record. Uh, the letter outlines concerns about the tax proposals on oil, natural gas, coal producers that we've been discussing. Uh, so I, I just want to ask you to give you a chance to clarify your energy tax proposals. In the Treasury Green Book, the summary of the administration's tax proposal says, quote, these oil, gas, and coal preferences encourage more investment in the fossil fuel sector that would occur under a, a neutral system. This may, market distortion is detrimental to the long-term energy security. Do you believe that oil, natural gas, and coal production is detrimental to energy security of the United States? Because I think you just said it is, because if we don't have the solar in the So it sounded to me like you were saying it's, that additional coal production and oil and gas is detrimental to our country. Time, time I, I didn't say that. I said Matt, it's a, the distortion is detrimental because it impedes uh, clean energy production. Time we need oil and expired. gas, but there needs to be um, a more level playing field. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me say that if there is a Biden whole of government assault on fossil fuel, the industry seems to be weathering it very well, considering that production is now higher than ever and indeed higher than ever in any country ever. Um, let me offer you a few thank yous, if I may, Madam Secretary. First of all, uh, contrary to Senator Brown, um, I would actually applaud the IRA hydrogen rule, 45V. Thank you very much for doing that. Thank if you. If we find that specific hydrogen projects um, that we would like to see go forward need some adjustment in order to make them credible in the market. I'm happy to have those conversations, but I think you certainly started in the right place, and I'm grateful. I want to thank you also for the FinCEN rulemakings. The world is swarming with international corruption and uh, a dark economy that supports it. And FinCEN's rulemakings and the resources we've been able to get to FinCEN, I think, have been very helpful. And I know you're now defending the, the uh, uh, Corporate uh, Transparency Act we are. Uh, from a spectacularly misguided decision. Um, and I look forward to supporting you in that. And then Thank your you. work on the global minimum tax has, I think, been extremely helpful. People like to say that it doesn't 
help with competition, but in fact, it really does help with competition. <laughs> and one of the competitions that is constantly overlooked is small businesses versus really big businesses that can go and hide revenues and move jobs overseas and get all these benefits and then compete with and crush small businesses that can't play in that I, space and take advantage of those tricks. So thank you for thank you. leveling that playing field. Thank you. Um, I see your enthusiastic nodding through my comments. I so agree I'm, I'm with what you've that. said. Um, <laughs> we are not going to solve the climate predicament that we are in under present policy. Pretty much every survivable scenario, um, or habitable may be the better way to say it, scenario requires carbon pricing. The two things that are pending right now are the social cost of carbon that OMB has directed everyone to respond to. And I would love to see Treasury and other agencies respond to that OMB directive. Um, and then the carbon border adjustment mechanism, the CBAM coming out of Europe for us. Uh, not only would I like to see the Biden administration figure out who's in charge on that, uh, I'd like to have them figure out that you should be in charge on that. And in any event, I hope that you will participate energetically in the interagency process as they figure out how to respond to that. Because a robust international tariff on carbon emissions is exactly how you solve the problem that Senator Barrasso mentioned of the pollution in the rest of the world. China is not going to reduce its pollution out of kindness. It's going to reduce its pollution because we're sending a powerful economic signal that gives them a huge incentive to lower their pollution. So I would encourage you to get involved in that as much as, as uh, you possibly can, because I think you may be the Biden administration's best Thank cabinet you. official on climate things. Um, and last, I just wanted to go over our um, ongoing discussions about 501c enforcement, which is not it's indirectly under you because it's happening in the IRS, uh, and we're going to continue working with Administrator Werfel about it. But you and I have had correspondence that I'll put into the record initially in February of 2021 about our conversation during your confirmation hearings. Uh, Treasury got back to us with a letter June 23rd, 2023, and we've sent a follow-up letter to both you and Commissioner Werfel. Uh, September 25th, 2023, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that those three letters. Here's the problem. There's, we're now over a billion dollars in dark money floating around in our elections. It's creepy as hell and it's corrupting. Um, and the tricks that have come to uh, facilitate it are having a whole series of 501Cs that break the 50% rule because they all sit in the same room at the same table and take the million dollar check and take 50% and then pass the 50% to the next fake entity down the table, which takes half of that and passes it to the next fake entity down the table. And by the time you're done, you get five fake entities around the table and 97% or whatever it is of the money is going through potentially to the same super PAC. It's a, it's, there's a lot of fakery and nobody's looking at it at the IRS. The other problem is that every 501c4 has its little twin 501c3. And nobody's policing the corporate veil between the 501c3s, which are supposed to do zero politics, and the 501c4s, which are limited to 50% politics. So we really need investigation in that area. Thank you for calling for an end to the creepy appropriations riders. Um, but the riders don't prevent investigation. I'd urge you to investigate. I thank my colleague, Senator Hassan's next. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks to you and Ranking Member uh, Crapo for this hearing. And uh, Madam Secretary, thank you so much for being here. Secretary Yellen, I wanted to ask you about a barrier that American businesses face in working to outcompete their counterparts in China. Currently, when a Chinese company invests $1 million in R&D, the Chinese government gives them an immediate $2 million tax deduction. By contrast, when an American business invests $1 million in R&D, our tax code provides an immediate $100,000 tax deduction. How does this unlevel playing field harm our efforts to outcompete China? Well, that certainly creates an unlevel playing field, and it is something that I think harms American businesses in comparison with China. 
Um, I think the Wyden-Smith legislation would help correct that. It um, restores the incentives to um, engage in R&D um, by restoring that tax incentive as well as doing a lot of other good things, including the child tax credit. And um, it, pays, it pays for those things um, in ways that essentially enable us to address a fraud and scam that is now serving right. not to help, but actually to, to harm small businesses. Well, thank you. Uh, I certainly agree. We need to restore the full R&D deduction in our tax code to better level the playing field with China to support investments in innovative products and create jobs here at home. So I'm really hopeful that the Senate will come together as soon as possible to pass the pending bipartisan tax package, the Wyden-Smith package, which would restore R&D deduction and cut taxes for hardworking families. Um, there's also strong bipartisan support for making home ownership affordable by expanding the low income housing tax credit, which is also part of the bipartisan tax package that we were just talking about. Another bipartisan effort I'm working on with Senator Tillis would cut taxes for families who purchase a home with mortgage insurance because they can't afford the full 20% down payment. Specifically, the bill would restore and expand the tax deduction that these families can take for their mortgage insurance payments. Secretary Yellen, how can providing tax cuts to home buyers and expanding programs like the low income housing tax credit make home ownership more affordable? Well, you know that there's a um, huge shortage of affordable housing, and the proposals that you've described would help to address what's been a very long standing problem. And I think they're important in um, making sure that. Um, that rents, especially for lower income uh, individuals, are uh, affordable. Um, LIHTC currently is the biggest support we right. have for housing, affordable housing. Yeah. And, um, you know, we would be happy to work with you also on the mortgage insurance proposal. I appreciate that very much. Uh, last question. Um, I want to talk a little bit about supporting retirement plans for employees who work for small businesses. Currently, small businesses can get a tax cut to help cover the cost of starting a retirement plan for their employees. It's worth $250 per employee. Due to this structure, the smallest businesses with only a few employees get a very small tax credit that doesn't fully cover the costs of starting a retirement plan. Because regardless of how many employees you have, there's still a basic overhead for starting up the plan. I'm working on a bipartisan bill with Senator, Senator Budd that would address this issue by ensuring that the smallest businesses get a tax cut of at least $2,500 to cover retirement plan startup costs. Madam Secretary, how can tax cuts for small businesses help increase access to retirement plans for their workers? Well, I think it's critically important that um, American workers have access to retirement plans so that they can um, look forward to a secure uh, retirement. And clearly, U.S. tax policy has been designed to promote those ends. And so if the smallest businesses face disproportionate costs, it makes sense that a proposal like the one you just mentioned could promote that goal. Well, I appreciate that very much. And we also know that small businesses uh, Women and especially um, women in vulnerable and marginalized communities are often uh, going in and out of the workforce in small businesses. So this is a way, too, to really uh, address some of the coverage gaps. So I look forward to working with you and your team on that. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Mr. Chair. time my colleagues has expired, I just appreciate her constantly coming back to the research and development effort, which you have consistently made bipartisan and done so for years. So very much appreciate your leadership. Next is Senator Warren, and then Senator Cortez Masta. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So last week, the IRS launched a pilot program called Direct File, a first-of-its-kind tool for Americans to file their taxes online directly with the IRS for free, for real. Um, so this is a big win for taxpayers. The average American spends about $150 and nine hours on average just preparing their taxes. 
And why? Because TurboTax and other big tax prep companies advertise their services as free, then suck people in, and then pile on fees and charges. That's how they make money. Now, the IRS is starting small uh, with a pilot that the Treasury Department requested to gather feedback from taxpayers to figure out how to improve the tool. Direct file is live right now in 12 states, including Massachusetts, uh, for about a third of taxpayers, mostly people with pretty simple taxes. Um, Secretary Yellen, from what you can tell so far in the pilot, have taxpayers found direct file accessible and easy to use? Well, I think they have, and I think a good example would be um, the very first individual who used it was interviewed for uh, an AP story. Sort of patient and, zero, is that? Uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, and, and she was really thrilled. She said that she had saved $400, that um, it was easy to use, and it actually, uh, she's somebody who I think doesn't doesn't like computations, and um, she she found it gave her the confidence um, to be able to do her own taxes um, using this tool rather than to having to go to a paid paid right. preparer. So, um, and of course the 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 feedback that we got before launching it formally, um, people who tried a trial version of it liked it very much. We saw a clear need um, to provide a simple and free tool. And we were really hoping to um, build on what we learn. Um, there's a little bit more time to go. We expect many more filers to use it. They'll give feedback on um, what their experience was. This is something it should be easy, user-friendly, free. Um, this, there's feedback within the program, a chat function. You can call someone if you have a question. We'll, we try to improve it over time, start small, build on it. Free and easy. Those are two great words here. I like this. This is a five-star review. And I'm really pleased to see what the IRS is doing with the funding that Congress provided Absolutely. for them. Absolutely. This is because there was the I yep. IRA funding. Yep. So a recent report said that expanding the tool, if the tool eventually goes nationwide and is available in all the states and available in more situations where you file your taxes, that it could save taxpayers $23 billion a year. That would be a return of over $100 for every $1 that the IRS invests in this program. And that is why Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Wally Adeyemo, said this year's pilot would be, and I quote him, the first step in an iterative process and a way to use lessons learned to inform the growth of the tool. So let me ask you, Secretary Yellen, if taxpayers continue to give direct file these kind of rave reviews, will you expand it and extend it in 2025? Well, look, we're, we're going to evaluate the feedback we get, but if they like it, it would be very natural um, to continue to build on it. Um, there's a lot more functionality that can be built into this system. Um, and, you know, one day we hope that, for example, information that taxpayers receive, uh, W-2s and other things, Will go, could be used to pre-populate the um, program, making it even more usable and friendly. Oh, that, I'm so glad to hear this. You know, look, no one is excited to go pay their taxes. But if you are going to pay your taxes, making it free, making it easy, trying to do everything we can to make government work for the American consumer, I think is terrific. I, and so I just want to say to all the taxpayers tuning in, uh, from Massachusetts or any of the 11 other states that are now in the pilot project, go to directfile.irs.gov, click on and see if you're eligible, and try this free and easy That's opportunity great. to pay your taxes. Terrific. Well, thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Madam you. Secretary. I, thank I, you, Senator I, Ward. I thank my colleague, and I would just say there's been a very important exchange, and it is little known, Madam Secretary, 
that the original roots of direct file were bipartisan. And Senator Dan Coates used to sit way down at the end. He was a junior member like, like me. We teamed up. So this has been a very important exchange between you and Senator Warren, and look forward to the progress we're going to make. OK, Senator Cortez Mesta. Thank you. Uh, Secretary, it's great to see you again. Thank you. Um, uh, similar to my colleague um, from Wyoming, I just came from Energy and Natural Resources Committee as well. So I want to talk to you a little bit about it. But I, I do, I think for the record, I uh, would also like to um, echo uh, really what you were saying. And this is from the words of the chairman of the Energy uh, Committee here in the Senate, who just penned an opinion uh, in Washington Post, who wanted to congratulate President Biden for the record-breaking energy production we are seeing in America today. The United States is producing more oil, gas, and renewable energy than ever before. We are exporting more fossil fuel energy from than we import, and our country has never been more energy independent than we are today. And he cites to the bipartisan inf infrastructure law as well as the Inflation Reduction Act um, that we've all worked on to get us there today. And I, I, I start there because this is important for me from Nevada, talking about the benefits of renewable energy that has really promoted jobs, good union jobs in Nevada and across the country, our economy, it helps us, and it helps us be energy independent. A lot of that work started here in Senate Finance as well. The yes. chairman talked about yes. this. The important work that the tax code plays in helping us with those projects to continue those investments long-term to keep us energy independent. So my first question for you, and you're probably not gonna be surprised because I penned a letter to you, is around 45X, which is the extraction um, tax. Um, uh, as you know, uh, I'm concerned with the proposed rule. It's a proposed rule right now for 45X. It's the Advanced Manufacturing Production Tax Credit on Critical Mineral Extraction and Processing. Namely, the administration's decision to exclude raw materials and extraction costs in the proposed rule. Um, it, it really, extraction of minerals is a key part of building our secure supply chain. Not just coal Agreed. mining, it's hard rock mining. It is the critical yes. minerals we need for that uh, renewable energy future that we are all leading into. And so I, 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 my question to you is if you are willing to elaborate now on where Treasury's viewpoint is on this issue. I know you're in the comment period, but I do think having extraction costs as eligible uh, is the clear intent, I know, of my intent when we uh, drafted and passed this legislation. Well, let me just say that expanding the full supply chain of critical minerals in the United States is certainly an administration priority. Um, the, the rules, the proposed rules, sort of focus the incentive on the cost of the value-added activity that's happening in the United States when you transform inputs um, into eligible components. We thought that that was the way to best support the goal of building a domestic supply chain. But we specifically in the NPRM asked for, comment, for comments on how to design the rules in a way that would appropriately credit extraction costs without creating economic distortions or risking um, waste, fraud, or abuse. And we recognize there are a range of views on this. We're reviewing the comments we received. Um, this is an important issue. I agree with you, and it is a goal to make sure that critical minerals are produced in the United States. So um, we welcome your input, and we're reviewing comments we, that we have received, and we'll try to figure that in as we go forward. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let, let me talk a, a little bit about another issue I've worked on, which is tribal tax reform. Um, I, I was pleased to see that the Green, Green Book includes a proposal to treat tribal health loans and scholarships with the same preferential tax treatment as other health professional programs. This, really, this is part of legislation that I have been working on uh, to address ta uh, tribal tax reform in this committee. Um, I, I will say um, we are looking at other areas. For example, um, 
uh, my bill addresses a number of issues in the tax code where tribal governments and citizens are not treated the same as non-tribal entities. For example, tribes are able to issue tax free bonds for infrastructure and tribal employee benefit plans are not treated in the same way as, as state government plans. Uh, excuse me, tribes aren't able to issue tax free bonds. These are issues I've heard from them, talked with them, and want to continue to try to address, to bring that to committee, because I think it is important in a bipartisan way for all of our tribes across the country. But my question to the administration is, would you be willing to work with us? A absolutely. Thank you. We are very concerned with tribal um, matters. I think you know that we have established a first ever Office of Tribal and Native Affairs in Treasury. They're working very closely with our Office of Tax Policy. There are a lot of issues around tribal tax issues. Mm -hmm. We want to get right. We look really like to work with you on this. I appreciate that. And again, for, for the chair and, and ranking member, I, I think tribal tax parity is really a, an opportunity for us to focus on this. Uh, in, my in this my, committee my colleague forward. has always been a little bit too logical for Washington sometimes, but I strongly, Madam Secretary, support what the senator is saying, and she's our go-to person for the committee. Senator Young sprinted to get here uh, to ask his questions, and Senator Young, you're up. Thank you, Chairman. Madam Secretary, uh, I share the concerns raised by my Republican colleagues about the Biden administration's handling of the OECD tax negotiations. Uh, every single member of this committee, Republican or Democrat, should be outraged, outraged at the way President Biden has undermined Congress's constitutional role in tax writing. The president's used you, your office, the Treasury Department to make an end run around Congress by rewriting American tax laws. It's been done in collusion with bureaucrats in Paris, all the while raising taxes on American employers and giving our tax base away to Europe. What's even more frustrating uh, to me is that the OECD minimum tax manages to both raise taxes on U.S.-based businesses and likely reduces U.S. tax revenue at the same time. Now, at the same hearing last year, I raised concerns with how the OECD Pillar 2 deal, as currently negotiated by you and your team, would completely undermine important tax credits, such as the research and development credit. I haven't heard of any significant movement from Treasury on that uh, front since uh, the time of that hearing until earlier this week on Tuesday. Your Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Affairs, Scott Levine, was quoted saying that while he believes favorable tax treatment for the US R&D credit will be resolved with OECD administrative guidance it's possible it will be necessary for the Biden administration to revert to what he called Plan B. He went on to clarify that this Plan B referred to legislation, legislation that would have to be passed by this body. Now, Madam Secretary, this is uh, the first that I had heard of the need for legislation to address the administration's failure to secure U.S. interests in the Pillar 2 model rules. This, this needs to be fixed. Uh, I, I said it last year, I'll say it again now. Uh, uh, you need to go back to the table and negotiate. And if you're unable to fix this with the OECD, I, 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 uh, please tell me more about this plan B. Please tell me more about this plan B so we know what's coming, including how much this hypothetical legislation is going to cost the American taxpayer. So um, countries participating in the OECD process understand that the R and treatment of the R&D tax credit is a critical issue for us. And we believe we have an opening to negotiate with them to um, try to resolve this in a way that will be favorable. And that will be through OECD administrative guidance, uh, presumably. Right, and if that fails, uh, according to Assistant, Deputy Assistant Secretary Levine, we'll be resorting or reverting to Plan B. Well, look, we have resolved a number of issues favorably through administrative guidance that um, affect the United States. Um, 
such as the treatment well, I, of I, I've tax got one, a minute equity, 20. partnerships, the low-income yes. housing tax credit, the green energy credits, and um, I, I that was done through administrative guidance. Reasonably, but if that fails, chance. Plan B is, and I've got a minute left. Plan B. Tell me more about Plan B. Well, I don't think there is a detailed plan B. Not but, yet. But it is clear that refundable tax credits are, um, are, would, would not be uh, penalized by um, the global minimum tax. And so it is conceivable that this could be restructured um, to it's clearly conceivable. qualify. And we would stand ready to work with you to accomplish that. Do, do you commit to providing this committee with uh, updated revenue estimates for Pillar 2 and for the proposed uh, Plan B legislative action within the next, say, 60 days? I mean, this, this committee I, needs to know what to expect and, and, and what sort of Plan B to prepare. Uh, we are working to resolve this issue, and we'll stay in close touch with you as we do that. Can, can, can we get this information in the next 60 days, Madam Secretary? We will let you know how the negotiations are proceeding. I'm not, I'm not promising to provide um, estimates of a plan B that hasn't been uh, worked out um, or is, does not exist. We're, we're working to resolve this. Um, it sure would be nice to have Treasury's assistance to contingency plan for the failure of, of uh, providing some, some uh, uh, influence in what OECD's administrative guidance looks like. Uh, and, and, and because I'm not highly optimistic that that will be resolved, uh, and, and, and thus we would be required, uh, per uh, the, the Deputy Assistant Secretary, to exercise Plan B, which is quite vague. Thank you, Chairman. I thank my colleague, and I think this is an important issue to be clear on. First of all, Senator Young has always been a champion of research and development, and we appreciate it. And I would only say that because Article I of the Constitution gives the Congress the authority in terms of taxes and trade, whatever the administration proposes in this area will come to us, and we will try, as we always have, to work in a bipartisan way. So I thank my colleague for it, and I think it all starts with Article One, and uh, we'll go we'll go from there. So, Madam Secretary, it's been a long morning. We appreciate uh, your patience, and uh, you know, under normal circumstances, I would give a passionate closing statement, but uh, I want to let you uh, get uh, on your on your way. I think we understand that Americans, and I think whatever political party you're in. You want a strong economy, you want a fair shake if you don't have big fortunes and, and lobbyists, and uh, uh, we want policies that drive down our costs in medical and housing and, and energy. And in my view, it really starts with the bipartisan effort that got 357 votes in the House of Representatives. Folks, you can't get 357 members of the Congress to agree on ordering a soda. And yet virtually every Democrat and every Republican said, we're together. We want to get this done. And we continue to try to find common ground here. As I've talked to my colleagues who are in, in the room, uh, when I have visited with Republican senators, they have said their number one concern about the Smith-Wyden proposal was the look-back provision, because they thought that in some way this could discourage work. Now, the Joint Committee on Taxation said specifically they don't share that view. But in the effort to find common ground, we have offered, and it is on offer today, as of 1215, right now, to remove the look-back provision in an effort to find common ground and do something bipartisan. Colleagues, people hardly can remember the last time the Congress did a significant tax bill in a bipartisan way. We are on the precipice of being able to do that with 357 votes and a willingness to keep talking and try to find common ground. The clock is really ticking down. You know, the filing deadline is on. And I just, as we wrap up, 
say that in terms of this agenda for the American people, and Senator Young correctly talked about research and development, this is all about what's actually going on out there. I've talked to a lot of these small companies that are research oriented. Some of them in North Carolina apparently are in the press. They heard about the idea that, well, maybe Congress will just wait. Just wait till 2025. And some of them have said, we're not going to be around in 2025. So Madam Secretary, uh, thank you for uh, your time this morning. We've got a lot of work to do, and I think it begins with a bipartisan effort that got kicked off in the House of Representatives with 357 votes. Our door is open to make sure that we can find common ground over here and get a big vote over here. And with that, Madam Secretary, we're adjourned. Thank you.